Hello, test. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, today, my name is Jia Yu, and I'll be talking about some of my experiences working on uh, Project App Engine. Uh, something and some practices that I and sort of what guide sort of guide my my journey as a developer and also talk a bit about DevOps at the end as well. So a bit about myself, I'm, a, I'm currently a student at SUTD and actually this next week I'll be starting my final term so I'm graduating this year and entering the workforce. Uh, also recently in the middle of last year I started writing a blog and I've, gotten, I've written a few articles in several publications and including the first article which I felt which got much more traction than originally expected. It was just about how to use some APIs to conduct a sentiment analysis during the altercation between our Prime Minister and his brothers. And so that's what got me started with all this when uh, the Google Cloud Platform publication us to publish my article. So I'm also an avid developer and I like to work on my own projects in my spare time. So some things I've worked on include uh, maybe a, a way to play fantasy football but instead of with Premier League players but with your own friends that I play with. In fact, right now my friends are playing soccer without me at Turf City. And another project I've worked on is uh, a way to create pseudo spoiler text in WhatsApp. And I did this with one of my friends, Tian, who interned at WhatsApp last year. And the, so the bus ETA board is the project that I'll be using as an example today and is, I'll go back, go into detail a bit later. So maybe some two random things I wanted to talk about. Uh, uh, I maybe, if some of you recognize this, I'm an Ingress player and also this, I'm also a developer keyboard layout user but hardly find anyone who, anyone else. So moving on, why I'm talking about App Engine is, as already mentioned, Bus ETA bot runs on App Engine. And uh, what, is, what is surprising to me is I'm proud to say that is, this is also the sort of the story of my first 100 users. Uh, Bus ETA bot actually gets close to 100 unique users every, every month, which is quite a big deal for me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I know there are plenty of other apps out there, other apps and chatbots, but this is, but this is my own. So it runs on App Engine, and another priority for a developer, for a student and an unpaid developer like me is costs. And so another thing I'll say is that Rusty Table also runs completely free under the App Engine free tier. And also next, uh, in terms of performance, this is, a, this is a screenshot from App Engine Logs, and it consistently, it's able to consistently respond in, consistently respond fast to users, which is uh, important for user experience with a chatbot. And even one thing that App Engine has allowed me to do is even after a cold start. So here you can see a bit from eight hours and then 11 to seven, but it's still able to respond in under a second. So this is this what sort of my own basic uh, principles for principles that I use to guide my development process. And so I'll go into how the first one is, expo is exploring and experimentation. Uh, I'll go get back to that slide later. Here you can, so chatbots have become quite a hot topic in recent years and uh, this is this example of one such website that's building, building on the chatbot wave. They call themselves the world leading chatbot platform but, and it's very modern but actually they have more history than just that. So, we sc so scrolling right at the bottom, there's right behind this sign-in link, you can actually find this so 2000s old school website and this is actually something that I did way back in 2006, 12 years ago in a SEC2. So like any, any other SEC2 kit, what I made is a chatbot that was meant to be a duplicate of myself. And looking back at it right now is sort of quite cringy. And one of the things I did is try putting in some of the names of my secondary school classmates and I found all these, all these special responses that I actually trained it to save. They were to talk to my so-called clone. But, and so that was 12 years ago when chatbot technology wasn't based on machine learning or neural networks, but simply string-based pattern matching. And how you trained it was just by asking, telling it things you wanted, telling it things and keying in what you, how, it, how you wanted it to respond. To be honest, in some aspects, this hasn't changed even today, many years down the road. So this is currently one of the state of the art is Google's dialogue flow. And similarly, with.ai, API.ai, all these chatbot platforms all use a similar user, in, uh, user me message examples to user intent mapping. And dialogue flow is something that I am exploring, but I haven't really gotten into. And 
So uh, let me go back to this to this slide. This this slide represents the history of my of my bus ETA board actually since 2015. Uh, tw in 2015, so this is sort of my exploration phase. In 2015, that was when I first really started programming uh, and building real projects, and I launched my application on Heroku at that time. So Heroku is quite a user-friendly platform, but one of the drawbacks was on the free tier, the cold start timings were extremely slow. So if someone was talking to my bot after, after the night, or even after half an hour, that's when Heroku shuts down free dinos, then they will actually have to wait more than a minute for a response. So in, in resp after that, I moved on to AWS Lambda, jumping on the serverless train, and, and uh, experienced much, got much better performance out of it. And, uh, one year later, I moved to Cloud Functions for no other reason, just because I wanted to experiment with it. My bot was, I was actually part of the Cloud Functions alpha testers, and that was, when, that was how I got, and I continued developing my bot there. So my most recent move was to App Engine later on, and I'll talk about some of the motivations for this later on, but the short story is for, it's because of the integrated APIs that I could access in it. So jumping forward, uh, we'll talk about how I, now next, after I exp explored, experimented with all these things, was the next step was to actually take a deep dive and learn and figure out how some of these, figure out how to really use some of these things. And I'll just talk, give a bit of background on App Engine before I move on. Uh, App Engine is, is a, it actually introduced many years ago in 2008, and even before serverless became a keyword, is arguably one of the first serverless applications out there and classified as a platform as a service. So for those who aren't familiar with the term, let's imagine you wanted to build your own web application. Uh, you, will need, you will need the hardware, you will need hardware to run it, you will need an internet connection since it's a web application. Then depending on what language or what stack you use, you will need to ensure all this software is installed. And in maintaining an application, you need to keep track of OS updates, software updates, and ensuring that it can serve all your users. And this is where infrastructure as a service comes in. So previously, when you had to have a dedicated dark line, dedicated IP for your, to run your own things, uh, with infrastructure as a service, you can just rent it from some cloud provider. So platform as a service just takes this one step further, and, you do, and it leaves you to care about nothing else but your own code, and while the platform will just handle, just takes care of all the other concerns. And App Engine is an example of platform as a service that provides many more many more functions that, such as uh, HTTPS out of the box with their recent managed SSL or authentication, search, storage, uh, many other services. And when people talk about App Engine, there are two, two main environments, the standard environment and the flexible environment which was recently introduced. And for, for my case, I use the, flex, the standard environment because uh, there are the two main differences between these, uh, the standard the main reason is that the standard environment can scale down to zero, which means that when I, when I receive no traffic, I'm not paying anything. That's, that was one of my priorities. On the other hand, the flexible environment does, but the trade-off is that the standard environment code that runs in the standard environment is subject to many restrictions, such as a sandbox, which means you cannot do things like write to the file system, cannot write to the file system, and, and only supports actually four run times, uh, Python, Java, Go, and PHP. On the other hand, the flexible environment uses containers, so actually you can deploy whatever you want into it, and is more designed for consistent traffic. So you'll be paying for you'll be paying for constant for constantly having some instances up all the time. But uh, so that's why I chose to use the standard environment. So I'll just briefly go through not not going to go through very deeply, but just want to talk about some of the APIs that. I use in the standard environment and how I make use of them. Uh, as Rahul mentioned just now, there's the data store as one of the storage options on App Engine. And uh, for me, moving from, from AWS Lambda to App Engine, the main advantage I saw of data store over Dynamo, which could be comparable, was the ability to actually query, sort, and filter on data store entities compared to DynamoDB, where you could only you could only search within a partition key on the sort key. So there was a time when I had to write an application layer system to collect, to collect the top end queries on DynamoDB. So you know, it was quite confident to be able to do this out of the box on Data Store. And so for, the, for my bus ETA bot, what it uses Data Store to is just to save the various details of the bus stop. So let's say you send it a bus stop code, it's a, or such 96049, it's able to just hit the Data Store and look up the bus stop description, such opposite Tropicana condo and the bus stop 
code. Uh, so this is just a, just a screenshot of how the data stuff looks like at the console. Next, so this is the search. The cloud if App Engine Standard provides a search API. The search API is actually the reason why, the main reason why I moved over to App Engine. Let's say you wanted to implement full text search and geospatial search in one of your applications. The direct path would be to use an uh, external SQL database or maybe Redis also supports uh, these sort of queries. But that would mean paying for an additional instance and paying as you use it. And I, didn't, I wanted to keep my application free and conveniently App Engine has this built-in pay as you use search API that, that does support full text search and geospatial queries. So this is what I use for the... I realized I missed out one slide just now, which is a demo of my bot. So maybe if you're a bit lost, let me just jump, let me just jump back there. Here, I'll just show a bit of how you users can key in a bus stop code and immediately sends back this conveniently formatted series of bus stops. And if you bring, you might just see some of the numbers changing with the refresh button. And so if we hold on a while, we also see the search function that I was talking about. The Telegram supports this thing known as inline queries. So here we are searching for Hubble site, the bus stop outside. Yep. So sorry for missing this just now. Let me jump back. That's, that's how. So that's using this geospatial query, searching for a distance, a point within a certain location is how the, I can return bus stops within a certain location. And this is just what it looks like in the console. Finally, I'll talk about, not finally, but I'll also talk about cron and task queues, which Rahul also mentioned. For, in my case, I use cron and task queues. To, cron is just a, cron is just a name for scheduled tasks. So if you imagine bus stops, sometimes bus stop, name, bus stop names change. Uh, every now and then, and you in when this when they change, you have to there's no you have to get it out of the so when they change, I'll need to up, update all my entities in the data store and search for the new bus stop names. How I accomplish this is using a set of monthly monthly cron jobs to that will hit a that will that trigger a scheduled task a monthly cron, cron job that triggers some task queue job. So also, as previously mentioned, task queue allows you to bypass the 60 second request timer that App Engine enforces and to work in the background. And updating the close to five or 15,000 bus stops, I can't remember the number, it take, takes more than 60 seconds and that's why uh, it's important to do this in the background, in the background instead of in a request. There's, so there's task queues and cron. Next, I'll just briefly talk about logging. Okay, logging, nothing much. It shows you uh, all the logs by timestamp and different metrics that you can drill down on. But since my application only receives one kind of traffic, it's not that useful. You can see that everything is just opposed to the same endpoint. And, but it does show timings and errors, which could be useful when you're debugging. One, so the last feature I'll talk about is something that I only found out recently, but I think it's extremely useful. It's called, the, it's called trace, traces. So application tracing is one way to actually really measure the performance of your applications. And uh, at, in app, app Engine integrates with the trace tracing, the stack, stack driver tracing, and you can actually see, for example, this is a trace of a request that took one second. And I can see that I actually spent half a second calling the search API and getting results, and another half a second responding to the Telegram API. Uh, in another example here, you can see that calling the L getting ETAs from the LTAs API, it takes 0.2 seconds, followed by half a, a 50 millisecond data store get. So data store is quite fast. And another response to the Telegram API. So for performance, for those performance-oriented people, the trace the traces can be a good starting point if you want to look for where the bottlenecks in the application and get rid of them. Uh. So just that's, that's about just the App Engine features I wanted to share about. If you really want to look at how it's used, you can check out my bot's code, which is open source. But I'll just talk about the last step, which is just after you have learned and moved, after you have learned some new things, all you can do is you can continue using it. But what I like to do as well is to just go back to exp exploring and looking for new things to do. And one thing that and so after I deployed my bot, one thing that I started looking into was this thing called DevOps which is uh, really quite a, another 
kind of hot topic now. I talk about many things, but at its core, DevOps is just about develop. It's just a combination between software development and software operations. So, give an example. Software. Let's say you wanted to put a website online. Software development will include building building a website. While operation would operation entails putting a website on the internet and ensuring that it stays on the internet. Like, if you receive more traffic, you need to make sure that it make sure that you're able to handle that more traffic. And back, so DevOps is in the previous you see a lot of cycle sort of imagery. This is because it's also a continuous process. Let's say you wanted to update your website, that's Dev work again. But when you want, once you want to push those updates back out, it's also ops. And what DevOps is sort of this is a picture I took from. Actually, the AWS documentation, but it's quite it's quite descriptive. Nevertheless, it's about this feedback loop between building, testing, and deployment to your your delivering applications to the customer, and also collecting feedback from them. And that's how it makes it a loop. And the objective of DevOps is actually to re decrease the time between creation between developing application and delivery. So tighter feedback tighter feedback loops and development cycles. Uh, one. One tool that, one feature, of, not feature, one aspect of DevOps that I also read about is called continuous integration, delivery, and deployment. What it means is, it's an emphasis on automation. So imagine you were deploying your deploying your application. I was talking about one one way would in the one way would be every time you write your code, you manually run some commands, push it to the cloud, you run more commands, scale it up and down, or check logs. Like imagine a Heroku workflow, git push. Heroku master when you want to deploy, then if you wanted to debug, you could push out a new one, or you could Heroku locks and view, manually view a lock. So that's all a manual flow, and uh, this is just DevOps too. So that's very manual, but as I said, DevOps is about automation. And one of the sources, one thing I read about automation was this, was uh, is, uh, Google's Site Reliability Engineering book, and it talks about the evolution of automation and a sort of hierarchy of automation. And this uh, excerpt from it talks about how no automation, let's say when you wanted to do a database failover, is you notice the database is down and some engineer manually logs on and fails over the database. That's right at the, at the end. Halfway, uh, a bit down the chain, you could have scripts. So you have, uh, once you notice that there's, there's something down, someone that page, then it just runs a certain preset script and it fails over the database. And all the way at the end of the hierarchy is systems that don't need any automation. So the database notices problems and automatically fails over. And that's sort of the what what you strive towards in automation when in automation. And that's what I explored and when I wanted to get around to learning it. So how I how it worked for me, for myself, is sort of a similar process. In the beginning, my app engine projects, I would update my code and then I manually manually deploy it to my environments with the command line tool. Uh, for example, with Cloud Functions and Lambda, when you want to deploy multiple files, you, don't, you, need, you can't just deploy it as is, you need to zip it up before deploying. And so manually would mean zipping it up first, then running a command and updating the function. Afterwards, to say some time, I wrote some scripts to do it. So I just wrote a script there, I run it, it would zip up the file and unload it for me. But Finally, I started looking into, into CI CD to fully automate the process. And this is a chart of how, C, how, the, DevOps, how the pipeline for Bus ETA bot currently looks like. So, my code, after I develop my code, I'll push it to, I push it to my GitHub repository and autom automatically it's pushed to these CI providers that will pull it down and run, some, and run tests on it. And in, once these tests pass, they are, they, the SDK and scripts are actually invoked by the CI provider automatically, and it pushes my, and it pushes the code into, into App Engine and into production or staging first actually. So, just so that's for that's regarding the how my code is deployed and continuous integration. I wanted to maybe give some, go a bit deeper into this, but perhaps I'll do so in. Maybe in a blog post or another format. Uh, just briefly go on to other, the next part of the feedback loop. Besides delivering a product to customers, you also want to get feedback from them. And one way is through analytics. So simil similarly, uh, my application uses the Google Analytics measurement protocol, which is for recording custom events. Uh, Normally, you will have a tracking screen on a website, but the measurement protocol lets you record any sort of events you want. And I use it to track uh, in both unique users and the popular actions. In this screenshot, this is a screenshot of, from, my two, from my analytics dashboard, and, and it tells me that uh, out, of, 
more than seven, actually 60, close to 70% of all requests to my board are actually to refresh the ETA. So if you remember, there was the message that you can hit refresh on and it updates the ETA. So that's the main, that's what you most users spend doing. And the second most, the lagging far behind, the second most common action is actually an ETA text message, which is sending a new message that requests timings for a new bus stop. And that, from this, I can actually see what's the main use patterns for my bot. Most people just, they just want to send a bus stop code and just refresh the timings until the bus arrives, presumably. And, but the other features I've been mentioning, such as searching or geographic, so actually, truthfully, it's not really used that much, but it's just, implementing it was fun for me. And there are people who use it, so it's, I mean, it's not a wasted effort. Uh, one fun thing that I did and wrote about before was to use, actually use cloud functions and the reporting API to actually display the numbers of, the number of users that use my bot in real time on my, in my, on my GitHub page, just as a shield. It was just, so it was just a, just some side project that I did to implement this stuff, to mix into this stuff that I learned. And that brings me to my summary, it's, uh, it's all about in the, the, my own development process starts out with when I hear about a new topic or I want to do something new, I'll, I'll start pursuing this, I'll explore, I'll experiment. And once I think of a use case or something I can do with it is when you go to learn more about it, and apply it. And after you have made something with it, you can move on to learning more things. And that's about the end. But I'll, since I have some time, I'll talk about, I'll just briefly show a few examples. So this, this, these are just what, this is just what a continuous, what Travis or Semaphore, what the CI tools look like. So what happens after you push a commit? You can see that this, this stuff are commit statuses and it shows what happens after the CI provider pulls a commit and it runs a test and then they report back on what the status of it and the test is the CI provider after it, it it will run pull down your code and run many tests and afterwards depending on whether it succeeds or fails so in this case it exited is zero which means that for this build my test pass it moves on to deployment and is where many other many other things happen so there are, there are many different CI providers with different speeds and things. And something that I didn't mention just now is something called code coverage that you, that is also it's sort of integrated into CI flows where you want to see how much of your, how much of your code is hit by your tests. So in, this, in this screen, you can see that the lines in green are actually covered by the test or the lines in red aren't. So while 100% code coverage is something to, is, could be a good thing, but it's also kind of ambiguous metric. There's no point writing tests that don't replicate real life, real life conditions either. So it's just as a as a stat person, it was just something fun to integrate into, fun to integrate and display on my display on my page. Another one is just this just the dashboard, the analytics dashboard that shows like there's actually one user going somewhere right now. There are 65 users, 65 people use my bot in the last week, and in terms of user retention, it's actually not very successful. I probably have a group of core users and that's it. But there's hopefully, but this is just a small project of my own either. So it's not that a, not that a big deal. So anyway, that's, that would be, that's it, for, that's it for my presentation today. And if for those of you who are interested, here is my contact. Here are some, some of my contacts and uh, my slides are also, I already put my slides online and it's on my website if you want to take a look at them as well. So thank you. Sorry? Oh, that's, that's really part of experimentation as well. I just want to see, just want to see more check marks and put more badges on my readme. 
Yeah. Have you tried playing with uh, Facebook WhatsApp? Uh, yes, I looked into the. I did consider doing it, but I, because of the, I at that at that time I didn't really want to. Since one of the since Telegram is just an API key and you just call URLs and that's your pop-up. Facebook requires you to create a Facebook application and set up many other fields that I didn't. Those are just some hoops that I didn't want to jump through at the at the moment, but I do want to consider doing it. And actually, uh, Dialogflow and other tools that I have been exploring, I noticed that they do have these sort of integrations for Facebook. So maybe if I just work with those, I can just have a one-click deployment to these other platforms as well. True, and you will definitely have more than one, I'm very sure. Because in Facebook, there are many people, you can definitely market it much easier. That's true. Nice you. project. How long do you spend on this project? Uh, I started this project in 2015, but my development already is actually quite on and off. So maybe right after after I let's say the first time I made it on Heroku, then up for one year I don't update it until oh let's move to Lambda, and then I work on it for maybe two weeks, and then and there's yeah, and then I deploy, it and then I don't, and I just sit on it for another year, then oh there's a cloud functions beta, and then, then afterwards I work on it for another few weeks and put it up there and. After actually after so it's maybe it takes me about two two or three weeks and then I made a new version but and the, with the most recent one on App Engine I did it in June and I actually didn't touch it for a while until LTA Hackmart was going to push up some breaking changes to their API so I had no choice but to go back and update my board otherwise we have stopped working so it's sort of in regrettably it's sort of in maintenance mode right now but I do hope to go back and. Add some new features. One of the one of the items in my backlog is I want to obtain feature parity with some of the other bus ETA apps out there, just for the sake of competing. Yep. <laughs> Okay, uh, the stack trace that that log bar made yep. it seem like very long. I know it's still sub second, but did you feel like the the Telegram API was slow? I'm uh, actually quite surprised at how long it takes for that. Because when I only found out this recently and I know that I was quite surprised by some of the timings of these things. Um it's true I I think the Telegram API is sort of slow, but it could be because of the geographic locations. Although I do know they have a data center in Singapore, but maybe the bot API doesn't hit the Singapore data center. It goes to Russia every time. Probably. <laughs> okay. But one one thing that I have been thinking about is whether whether there's actually a point in like, let's say calling this external search or data store or just searching a static file since depending on how big the data set is. In fact, previous versions of my bot, such as Lambda and Cloud Functions, all I did was I just load a JSON file in the memory and, and search it each time without any network round trips. But I guess using App Engine and search was good for the sake of learning anyway. And, in, and maybe scalability is one, one reason why, why is, even if it's slower than just reading a static file, you might want to edit in the application. I haven't actually found anything to do with this trace yet, like anything actionable. Great, okay, thank you. Let's give a round of applause.